it is not normal for there to be a culture of corruption. Too many children are growing up in countries where they think it's normal and it's normal culture for there to be corruption. It's not normal. <coughs> but you see, when a culture has gone too far and normalized corruption, you begin to even justify it even within the church. Yeah. Because right in the depths of the very institution of the church is corruption. And when God says we need to turn away from our wicked ways, he's not talking about people out there. He's talking about us. Amen. And for as long as we don't understand that, we will keep praying to God and bringing the name of God into disrepute because we are praying to a God and as people watch us praying to this God asking for the things we ask for and they don't see the evidence of anything happening people begin to see begin to think that our God is powerless and weak he is not powerless and weak he is absolutely all-powerful, but he cannot go against his word, which says we need to do something first before his power can be poured out. It's a dependent event. That pouring out and the healing of the land cannot happen before we have done our part. I'm just going to pray as I really start what I, the presentation and I'll refer back to this video a little bit later on. Father, I give you praise, I give you honor. I thank you, O God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I thank you, O God of Israel, O God of Zimbabwe, O God of Africa, O God of all the world, the Ancient of Days the mighty one in battle. I give you praise and I ask of you, almighty God, may you once again, O oh Father God, just show your power, Lord God, even as we get to the, to the end stages of this conference. Father, I pray that each person here will have a manifest experience of your power and who you are before we leave this place today lord jesus we are here because of your finished work your blood holy spirit may you move in unprecedented ways father i present myself before your throne of grace and once again i say lord may you help me to speak only that which you have given me to speak lord i pray that that which is not of you i pray that may it be forgotten and may it not remain in anyone's remembrance father may you hold me accountable to each word that i speak and i offer myself to every person who's here today that may they also hold me accountable to every word that i speak in these next 40 minutes father i thank you i bless you i love you in the mighty name of jesus i pray amen okay what i would like to do is I would like to break my 40 or so minutes that I left into two halves. I'm going to go through some of the material that I initially planned to go through, but I'm going to try and do it in 20 minutes instead of the normal 40 minutes because the Lord has really laid on my heart that the 20 minutes need the last 20 minutes need to be very different. So it's going to be very different. I also just want to ask and say that I am going to provoke. I'm going to challenge. There might be some things that might be very strange. But I trust that the Lord will come through very clearly in what he wants to do. 
Let me start off by talking about a few of the slides and I'll keep watching my, if you see me just looking here, I'm just wanting to make sure that I don't miss, miss time. I was hungry and you showed me the promised land. I was hungry and you showed me the promised land. Yesterday I spoke about how I was hungry and he showed us the wedding feast. That is a personal journey that the Lord takes us through. But there's also a collective journey of transformation that the Lord also wants to take us through. I shared a little bit of my story in terms of how the Lord began to work in myself, in my family, but also he had to take down the one idol that was very well lifted up in our house and in our hearts. And before that idol fell, there was nothing else that the Lord could do with us. And that idol was the idol of mammon. And I want to talk a little bit more about this idol of mammon. And how this idol of mammon, I believe, is the Goliath that is taunting Zimbabwe right now. It's the, it's the Goliath that is taunting a lot of nations. It's a Goliath that is even t taunting the church and saying, what will you do with me? I am here. I've even infiltrated your church. And what will you do about it? I trust the Lord will give us the strength and the power to do something about it. I started off yesterday by the three questions. I'm not going to cover those three questions anymore. Why are we in this situation? I believe we are in this situation because of two things. Firstly, it's lack of knowledge. There are things that we do not know. There are secrets that are in this word of God that maybe have not been revealed to us. There may be secrets in this word that have been hidden and will only be revealed to those who cross over into the place where Jesus then says, let me present the Father to you. I now call you friend, so I will now reveal everything that the Father says. And when that happens, we start to see secrets of the kingdom that are in this book that we've never seen before. And therefore, we are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. We are destroyed because of disobedience. We know, but we choose not to move in the way God calls us to move, maybe because of selfish ambition, maybe because we have not committed to transforming our minds into the wisdom of God. Maybe we are too comfortable with the pleasures and the wealth and the material things of this world and it's too difficult for us to make the transition into obedience because these things have given us so much comfort that we end up watering down the gospel and bringing the name of God into disrepute. I love this quote by one of the great revival leaders, A.W. Tozer. And he says, have you noticed how much praying for revival has been going on of late and how little revival has resulted? I believe the problem is that we have been trying to substitute praying for obeying. And it simply will not work. To pray for revival while ignoring the plain precept laid down in scripture is, a waste, is, a, is to waste a lot of words and get nothing for our trouble. Prayer will become effective when we stop using it as a substitute for obedience. I believe right now, this is one of the most controversial statements I'm going to make today. Please take it in all love. 
I believe 90% of the things that we pray, God has already told us what we need to do to make them happen. And therefore we waste a lot of time praying for things that we should not be praying for because God has already told us what we need to do for them to happen. Let's not be wasting time praying for things that God has clearly outlined what we need to do to bring them to pass. I just want to talk very quickly about the economy and I'll head into the whole issue of mammon. Um, essentially, when God gave mankind the very first mandate, when God spoke to mankind in Genesis 1.28, and from the Amplified Version, he says, he's given us all of this, and he says, be fruitful. Manage all these vast resources in the service of God, in the service of man. And I believe what God was doing was giving mankind a mandate in three primary areas. The first area is the area of the family. And he says, listen, let me show you when you come into marriage and you model marriage, a covenant, not an agreement. Marriage is not an agreement. An agreement is something that you break. Covenant is unbreakable. He wanted us, because you see, when our children grow up seeing the covenant between husband and wife because they've become one flesh, it becomes a demonstration of the covenant that the Father has with each one of us. And because there's so much brokenness in marriage, many people cannot see what covenant means because it hasn't been demonstrated in the natural to them. He also gave us the economic mandate. The economic mandate is manage all these vast resources, steward all of this, so that there would be replenishment on the earth forevermore because I've created abundance but because I've created you in my own image guess what you also have the power to create so therefore use all of this but also use the power that I've given you to create out of what I've given you he also gives the governmental mandate. And by the way, when God first gave this mandate, it wasn't a governmental mandate to rule over people. It was a governmental mandate to rule over creation. We've actually completely messed that one up because we think that government is about ruling people. Government was always about ruling creation. And when we get back to the mandate of ruling creation as sons and daughters, creation will respond to our rulership. You see, we have entered into, we are in a season where we have focused on ruling people and that was never God's intent. Right on the top there, he then says, listen, Keep teaching your children about family, about the economy, about my initial plan of government. Keep teaching them through an education system that never allows your children to be contaminated by the thinking of the world that is completely contrary to what we're just talking about now. For as long as our children don't understand for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's where everything comes from. And right at the top, the Lordship of Christ in all things. Christ is Lord, not just when we are together in the building of the church, but Christ is Lord even when we are in our businesses, when we are doing the work that we are doing. Christ is Lord over all. In a lot of situations, we have relegated, we've rele we've relegated Christ to be just the Lord of our gatherings in the church. And we've completely left him out in everything else that we do during the day. Christ wants his Lordship back. Why is this issue of the economy so important? I've spoken about the mandate that we were given to manage all the resources. At the end of the day, what is the economy? 
very simply put terms the economy is the means of production how you distribute what is produced and how you consume it that is just basic economics so what happened at the fall God says listen there is abundance you can eat as much as you want do as much as you want over there but you know what here is one resource that I have set out don't touch this resource the enemy comes in and says listen God is holding out on you he doesn't love you he hasn't given you enough let me show you something even better that's over here and what happens we get trapped into consuming a resource that God never intended for us to consume that's why I believe the fall was as a result of economic disobedience and therefore mankind has been consuming outside of the will of God ever since that's why we have greed that's why we have materialism it's that spirit within us it's that seed within us that desires to consume outside the will of God this desire has led to every single war there's ever been on this earth that desire has led to slavery that desire has led to all the ills that we can trace back to it's because it was planted within us this desire to consume outside the will of God it's very interesting that if you look at one of the passages that almost describes the fall of Satan from heaven as you know Satan was one of the one of the angels and it's interesting that the book of Ezekiel actually talks about this guardian angel that is thrown out of heaven and interestingly enough it says through your widespread trade you you were filled with violence and you sinned so I drove you in disgrace from the Mount of God and I expelled you your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor so I threw you to the earth I made a spectacle of you before kings by your many sins and your dishonest trade you have desecrated your sanctuaries I believe Lucifer was thrown out because of economic disobedience I'm not too sure what trade was taking place in the heavenlies at the time but I believe Lucifer was thrown out because of economic disobedience he takes it Jesus then walks and he says to the disciples listen guys you can't you can't possibly have two masters you have to choose one and you know what's so interesting in this I've always wondered why did he not why did he not say you can't serve God and the devil but he uses mammon and I wonder if the the reason why he did that he wanted us to understand and trace it all the way back that actually mammon relates to the fall of mankind in the garden and even relates back all the way back to the fall of Lucifer out of the heavens that this God of mammon is actually the very devil himself and when Chuck spoke last night and mentioned this God called Baal the God this God so-called God of prosperity this is what we are talking about this is the enemy this is the direct enemy I've always wondered why did God deal so harshly with Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts 5 and I believe the the reason why he dealt with them so harshly is he wanted the early church to understand I will not tolerate economic disobedience and I believe we are getting into a season now where God will show his hand upon us that he will not tolerate economic disobedience he will not tolerate us worshiping mammon anymore the choice is ours it's very clear 
what God is asking for. I believe the enemy uses the economy to hold billions of people in captivity because they can't see the purposes of God because they are so trapped in the material things of this world. And unfortunately, that becomes the idol. We will even, we will even change the gospel to speak towards that idol. We will justify that idol by twisting the word of God so that the word of God, so that in our hearts we can feel justified for keeping that idol on the wall and in our hearts. Friends, these are hard words, but we need to make a choice. We need to make a choice. We can't stand on the fence anymore on this issue. We can't stand on the fence anymore with this issue. You see, God gives us a grace period. Yeah. As much as he is filled with loving kindness, as much as he is filled with long suffering, as much as he is filled with mercy and grace, there comes a time in his season where he says, it's now time. And when it's time, what he has purposed will happen irrespective of whether we are ready or whether we are not. The, f the ten virgins got to the point where five were ready and as much as it almost seems unchristian like for the master to come back and for them to cry out to him and say master master please still allow us in but you know what the master says I'm sorry I gave you time the time has passed face the consequences of the time that has passed I pray that each one of us will be seen to be filled with lamps of oil mm -hmm. that our oil will be filled that when the master comes and he says guys there is the wedding invitation and the gate for us to go through we will be there I pray that each one of us will be there as I said there's a bit more that's still in my slides but I'm going to make a shift and I believe that what I'll also do I will leave I'll give um, the uh, foundations of uh, uh, farming office the copy of the slides if anybody wants to get those the, the, those are available you can go through the rest of that because what's sitting at the back of all of this is actually God's what I believe is God's full economic cycle that goes all the way let me just bring that one up so that you can see that a little bit it's an economic cycle that takes you all the way from what is in your hand to how you sow and invest, how you work your field, either whether it's a farming field or a business, and what you do to what you reap in your field. But the most important thing I want to mention is any cycle that God creates is a cycle that is filled with life even as you saw the demonstrations the soil that is filled with life is what will produce the compass that is filled with life is the compass that will produce an economic cycle that is filled with life is what will produce what are the key things that complete the cycle is exactly what Crown Financial Ministries is talking about because God says when you finish the cycle and he says when you give or you tithe to a storehouse 
that is focused on the widows, the orphans, the poor, kingdom activity. And by the way, bless Israel. He says, listen, you're no longer giving to man, you're giving to me. And he says, when you give to me, I will open up the windows of heaven and you won't even know what to do with what I'm going to release to you. That completes the cycle. The cycle is that God gives us everything to start off with, but you know what? At the end, we give it back all to him. And then he opens up the windows of heaven and we become a channel and a river of his resources being poured out onto the earth. The rubbish that is being spoken by those who carry I'm not even going to qualify it and call it the gospel of prosperity because the gospel of prosperity is this. What they carry is what I call the gospel of materialism. The gospel of materialism that is driven by mammon, that is driven by Baal, that is driven by the very devil himself. That is what they carry. This is sheep, this is wolves in sheep's skin. This is the false prophets that God talks about. Friends, let us be discerning in this season. Let us be careful what we listen to. Let's be careful what we follow. Let's be careful what we pledge allegiance to. Let's be careful because these are the seasons where we are in the valley of decision. The decision we make in this season is is going to be the ultimate decision. Let's not be lost in this decision. Let me change over for a few minutes before we come to the end and I'd like let me just explain to you what I would like to do so that you are very clear because one of the things I've also learned is to be very careful not to take people on a journey into prayer without making it very clear what that journey is because you might just be praying for something that you don't know about and you come into agreement with something that is completely off sides. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to give you exactly what it is that I would like us to do going forward. If anyone is uncomfortable with what I'm going to say right now, please, I fully understand. You don't have to do anything at all. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I was challenged again by Chuck yesterday Chuck, this is all your fault. (laughs) You said something last night and you said, don't just talk about giving, give. You know, that's a call to action. It's easy to quote verses. It's easy to talk about verses. It's a lot more difficult to do verses. Because when we do verses, that's when verses do us us. thank you so what I would like us to do let me just explain what I'm going to be asking us to do I'm inviting you to join very short 10 minute battle because you know what when we're all carrying the power of Christ as sons and daughters the battle with the enemy is very short. It's not a long one at all. It's not a long one at all. So what what I'm going to ask for is I really want us to call upon the commander of heaven's armies to come in our midst. Because the battle that we fight is not our battle, but it's his battle. Our job is to call him into the midst of the battle. How do we call him into the midst of the battle? When we enter into a spirit that we had this morning, where there's confession, where there's repentance, when there's forgiveness, automatically angels come 
onto the scene. Automatically, they come onto the scene. Darkness cannot stand an environment where people are confessing, repenting, forgiving. Darkness just has to flee. How do we call in the Lord of Heaven's armies? In the, in the Old Testament, the Israelites would sound the trumpet. Please hear what I'm going to say. Because I'm going to call up just now my sister message. Just keep sitting there, I'll call you just now. There's some people when they sing, God has placed a shofar in their voices and it breaks open the heavens and it releases angels onto a place. Last night when she stood up in that room in the church and she sang that song of the Lion of Judah, I can tell you the full room was filled with angels by the voice of this young lady. She has an anointing when she looks up to the heavens and cries out with her voice, angels are released by the Lord. Please hear me when I say this about this lady's anointing. So I'm going to ask her just now to open up the heavens for us. I'm going to ask these lovely ladies here to get the music going. <laughs> I'm going to ask some of the other ladies who have flags to get the flags going. Just for two minutes. Amen. Just to call the angels into this place in the most amazing way. Because we're going to go into battle. Because you see, when, when, when David went into battle against Goliath, he said, listen, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who is taunting the armies of the living God? You will go down today and I will cut your head off. Amen. Guys, as we invite the armies of heaven, I would like to ask you for two minutes, pray by yourself. If there's for unforgiveness that you're still carrying against somebody, release it in those two minutes. If there's physically somebody in this room that you need to go walk across and ask for forgiveness, do it. If there's somebody you want to pray with for those two minutes, do it while my sister here is singing, while these ladies here are lifting up their flags and we hear some nice music there, do it because the Lord's the armies of heaven will be working on your behalf. Once we finish those two minutes, I am then going to pray a very specific prayer. And that very specific prayer is going to be centered on a few things. So let me give you what those things are. First of all, I believe that God has taken Zimbabwe through a season of complete stripping. <clears throat> Zimbabwe is naked. The material things of Zimbabwe have been taken away. But you see, when the, when the Lord has finished that process, the enemy always tries to circumvent what the Lord wants to do next. And I believe the circumvention that the Lord has planted in this country right now is that very spirit of the gospel of materialism that is blinding the people of Zimbabwe from understanding what the next stage is that God wants to take this country to. And I'm going to pray very specifically that the armies of heaven will completely crush that spirit. And as I pray that, the very next thing I want to ask the Lord, as I want to ask him, that the windows of heaven of provision 
for, for foundations of farming are broken open so that the season of drought where they can't pay their employees comes to an end and that the overflow of the breaking of the spirit moves into this ministry. Amen. And the last thing that I will pray for is for Brian to come up and to share whatever it is the Lord has placed as I sit down to finish my time. So, <coughs> ladies, let's go. Sissy Mercy, please come. Search your hearts. What is it that the Lord wants you to release? Repentance, forgiveness, confession brings angels down. Let's bring the armies of heaven down in these two minutes. It doesn't take long. We worship you.